healing to our relationships with other people and keep those relationships healthy. The Bible says in 2 John 1, watch out that you do not lose heart and do not lose what you've worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. And that's my, that's my hope for you as we're coming, starting to wind down this series, that what you have started, you will carry it out to completion. What, what healing choices God may be inspiring in you and maybe stirring in you that you've been stepping into in the last several weeks, that you'll finish that race. If you've uh, ever been to a marathon race, you know that... Uh, it is a huge pile of people at the beginning, right? There's a huge bunch of people. And then uh, you, it, you see at the end, then there's one or two straggling over, you know, out of time over the, over the finish line. Uh, if, if you've ever gone that, that starting point, man, everybody looks great. Clothes are fresh. Hair's in a great place. Skin is uh, all refreshed. You know, everybody's looking great at the start of the marathon. And then you uh, see at the end, you know, it looks so good. You know, it looks so good. Clothes are tattered or sweaty. They're stinky. Probably sunburned. Their numbers ripped off. They straggle sometimes, crawl across the finish line, right? Hey, here's the reality. You don't get an award for starting the race. You get a reward when we finish. I want us to finish well. I want us to finish well. That's what I want for you as your pastor. And I want to talk to you about how we can finish well, how we can, can continue and run the race with endurance and then finish well. That's, that's the seventh choice in our healing choices, the growth choice that we're going to talk about today. The growth choice says this. Look at it with me. The growth choice says, I reserve a daily time with God for Bible reading, self-examination, and prayer, all right? That's, that's the growth choice. Why do you do it? Here's the reason. It's right, it's right there. In order to know God, that's the first thing. That's, that's why we're making this choice to reserve a daily time with God for Bible reading, examination, and prayer. To first, the first thing is to know God and then to know his will for your life. That's the second thing. And, gain, and to gain power or the power to follow his will. So it's to know God, and it's to know his will for your life, and then to be empowered in order to keep on keeping on, right? Spiritual growth, friends, is a choice. Spiritual growth is an intentional choice. It has to be an intentional choice. Are you going to be more spiritually mature a year from today than you are now? If you say, well, I don't know. You probably won't be. You, may, you with me? You probably won't be. If the, because growth is intentional. You have to choose, you have to choose to say, I'm not going to be the same next year that I am today. There's going to be some change. There's going to be some growth. With God's power, I'm going to be different by next year. I'm going, to, I'm going to let go of some of those painful things in the past. I'm, I'm going to have to let go of some of those persistent sins, some of those sinful habits that have kind of gotten a root in my life. I'm going to have to let go of some of those personal weaknesses, and I'm going to be better than I am now. That's, the cho that's a choice. You must choose to continue growing. I want to show you several different verses today, and one of the common themes I want you to be looking for in each of these verses that we're talking about is, is basically the word or the concept of continue. Continue. We're talking about the growth choice, and these verses are all going to have this idea of continuous growth. Growth is a part of, a, of the definition of being a Christian. The Bible really doesn't know anything about being a Christian and being stagnant. If you're not growing, you're dying spiritually. If you're not growing, you're dying spiritually. The Bible says this in 2 Peter 3.18. Grow, and, and, and you need to know that you don't see this in the English, but the tense, the form of the word, is that it's happening now and keeps on happening. 
grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow and keep on growing. That's the constant coaching. That's the constant inspiration of the scripture for us. So how do we, how do we keep on keeping on? How do I maintain momentum? How do I complete the course, finish the race, get the medal? Well, the Bible tells us there are seven things. I know it sounds like a lot, but we're going we're gonna to go through seven things. And just so you know, the seventh one's really short. So stay with me. Seven things that we're going to need to continue in each one of us, we're going to need to continue in in order to run the race with endurance and finish well, all right? The first one is this. I need to fix a daily time with God. These, t- these, these principles today are very practical, and many of you are probably already doing them, but this is refresh, just to refresh you. I need to fix a daily time with God. That means you nail down this time. You try to make it consistent every day, same place if possible, same time right? Then it becomes a part of your routine. If, it's more, if you're a morning person, let's take care of it in the morning. If you're a late night, I like to stay up till three in the morning, and I'm at my best, and I put on a fresh pot of coffee at midnight, then let's make it then. I know people like that. They're weird, but I know them. I grow a couple of different kinds of grapes at my house. Um, they're table grapes. So I have some like purple flame and some, what's the green one, the Thompson, whatever. And uh, they, the, my, my grapes, they, they haven't really done that well over the years. It's been interesting to me. The, the le- less I care for them, the better they do. <laughs> if those grapes, though, if they're in any way disconnected from the vine, they're not growing. That's what Jesus tells us. I'm the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, that's that powerful word, remain. That's that word of ongoing, continual. You remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's that's so stunning to me. I mean, it's just like straight. You, you, You disconnect, boom. You cannot bear fruit in your life. If you're disconnected from Jesus, you have to spend time in order to be close. It's like this in any relationship, right? You, you have to be, spend time in order to be close. Now, I want to tell you personally, I've been, uh, I, I've been a pastor for, for over 32 years. I've been walking with the Lord over 40 years. One of the hardest things in my life is staying consistent with my regular time with God. That may shock you. One of the hardest things is to remain consistent in my regular time with God. Why? Because everything fights against it. Everything. And if there isn't anything that fights against it, I'll think of something. (laughs) No, honest. Why? Why does everything in life fight against that connection time with God? Because Satan knows if he can keep you disconnected, you're worthless. If he can keep you disconnected from Jesus, you're worthless. You have no power. You have no defense. You have no strength against his temptations. He doesn't care what you do. He doesn't care what you do. You can do all kinds of good things. As long as you don't spend time with God, he's good with that. (laughs) Because that's the number one, your number one purpose in life, staying connected with Jesus. It's been said, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. If he can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Why does he fight so hard against your time with God by making you busy? Because he knows that time with God empowers you. It empowers you. That's your life source. That's your strength. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 6, everyone who lives in union with Christ does not continue to sin. Everyone who lives in union with Christ does not continue to sin. What does that mean? It means that when I'm connected with Christ, he gives me the power and the ability, the effort, the desire. He gives me everything I need to keep on keeping on, right? So that I don't do what's wrong and I 
engage in what's right. That time of connection empowers that. See, the reason why you and I keep falling into persistent sins and personal weakness and painful past things is because we don't spend time with God. <laughs> that, that's the honest truth. And if you don't get this one, this connect time, regular time, then the re all of these other choices, you might as well just forget about them. Because you, you could be, have well intentions about all the other choices, but unless, unless this power source is engaged, friends. So that's number one. Now, if you want to continue to grow and finish well, there's a second thing you'll want to do. Here it is. I must fill my mind with Scripture. I must fill my mind with Scripture. If you go without food very long, and for me, that's like five minutes. <laughs> if you go without food very long, what starts to happen to you? Maybe you start getting, maybe your blood sugar starts going wonky. Maybe you start getting a little, you know, groggy. After a while, you get hangry, right? That's where that phrase came in. You get a little cranky, you're hangry. And then after a while, you, you, you just, you're just lethargic. You just want to lay down. Well, the same is true with God's Word. You've got to think about the Bible as food for your soul. You've got to think about it that way. The Bible says man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, God's word is so crucial to us. We can't trivialize this. It's food for our soul. You, 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 you don't feed on God's word for, for a little bit of time, and then you, you start feeling a little groggy, a little dizzy, a little cranky spiritually. You start getting lethargic spiritually. This, it's the same thing. So we've got to keep God's word in our heart. James says it this way. This is familiar to many of you. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do it. See, there's that word. Continues to do it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. They will be blessed in what they do. This verse finishes like our Beatitudes, doesn't it? Remember, we've been in these Beatitudes. Blessed are, blessed are you, those who. Happy are those who. It says, you keep on doing it. They'll be blessed in what they do. The path to blessing and fulfillment, the way to thrive, James says, is by looking intently into God's word. It's interesting. That word intently means to stop, bend down, stoop down, pick something up and look at it intensely to figure out what it is. That's, that's the image that's there. Like, so it's studying it, it's, it's looking at it, it's reflecting on it. In our bathroom, we have, a, you know, like all of you do, we have a big, big mirror over the sink in the bathroom. You guys have mirrors over your sink, right? I can tell by looking at you, you got mirrors over your sink. And uh, we got this big, huge mirror over our sink. And uh, mo for, for most of the, you know, the distance from the counter, I can look in there and I can, I can see most things on, about myself, about my face. I can see most things. But over on the sidewall, my wife has this other mirror attached. And it, it's on an extendo arm, so you can get it real close. And then it's a double-sided mirror. So one side's normal, and the other side's magnified. So when you want to look intently into your eyebrows or your face or your ear, I mean, I'm having to look intently. I mean, there are things growing places that, that never used to grow. Hair grows where never, so I have to look intent and, and take care of things, right? Guys, you need to do this, some of you. Right? Just, it's just one brother to another. I'm just telling you. Do your, it's Valentine's Day. Do your wife a favor. Look intently, all right? But I'm telling you what, in this mirror, you're not the same person after you lift in this mirror. I mean, you see things, right? You don't want to see. But that's what this word means. It means fit, to fill your mind with God's word. It's just like with this magnifier mirror at home. 
You, you study, you dig into it, you, you think about it, you understand it, you digest it, and then you, 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 it changes your life. You're not the same person. This is why the Apostle Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what marinating in God's word does. What's fascinating about the field of neuroscience, researchers have discovered that the brain is moldable, trainable. And neuroscience discovers it, and now there's talking a lot about it. The Bible's known it all along. At the risk of oversimplifying this, this means that you put enough negative, you, you focus on enough negative, or you put enough unhealth into, into your uh, brain through your ears or through your eyes, and, and you, you, you create neural pathways that, that become negative. And now they're learning that you can actually retrain your brain. If you put enough positive in, if you, have, if you discipline yourself to practice putting enough positive in, it will impact your thinking, which impacts your mood and your emotions and everything positively. And, and it's proven, it's proven to, to work. So that proves what the Bible's saying here, like in Philippians 4.8. You, you thought it was just, you know, maybe, maybe Apostle Paul speak or whatever, and just trying to be inspiring, but it literally is true. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does he say? Think about that stuff. Focus on that. It's gonna make your brain healthier. It can make your heart healthier, you know what I mean? If you look intently into those kinds of things, all of a sudden, you're ready to face the world. After a bit of time, all of a sudden, your, your, your outlook changes. All of a sudden, you, you, you start to feel like, you know what? My best days are ahead of me. You start thinking that. Because you're filling your mind and you're building up your mind with the Word of God. So how do I run the race of life well and finish well? We've talked about fixing a daily time with God. Fill your mind with scripture. That sets you free. The third thing that you want to focus on, uh, the third thing you want to do is to focus on your goal, not your habit. Focus on your goal, not your habit. By habit here, I mean, I mean those sinful habits, hurts, hangups, those weaknesses, those failures in your life. We've been talking a lot about those throughout this series. These are the things in your life that you don't like. These are the things in your life God's putting his finger on and saying, we, we need to, to transition those out. We need to root those out. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Here's the reality. If you want to grow, you have to focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. You have to focus on where you want to go, not on where you've been. Don't live life in the rearview mirror, all right? Why is this so important? Because one of the laws of the universe is the law of attention, the law of attention. That wherever you focus your attention, that's where you're pulled. You know this when you're driving, right? You ever, you ever drive and you see something, you, you, start, you look out your side window at something, what happens, right? Guys, we're famous for this. I don't know if ladies do this or not, but I'm like, whew. you look around, wherever you're pulled, this is a law of attention. Whatever you focus on, that's where you're pulled. When you look off to the side, that's where, you're, where you tend to go. So what, when we apply this to our spiritual growth, whatever negative you want to change in your life, whatever, whatever you're trying to root out, don't focus on that. Don't focus on that. What you focus on is where you end up going. So it's the old, you know, don't think about apple pie thing. Okay? Now, I don't want anybody in here to think about apple pie. Don't think about it. Okay? No one's, no one's, 
Okay, we're all together now, I think. No one's thinking about apple pie right now. <laughs> we all are, right? It's one of the reasons why I, I really, really appreciate the ministry of Celebrate Recovery. Some of you are familiar with Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is a forward-looking growth process. Forward-looking growth. That's what they focus on. In fact, uh, I'm adding a week to this series because I want to bring some of our Celebrate Recovery folks up in two weeks. I want to bring them up, and I want to do a little dialogue with them, a little conversation with them. I want you to hear from them because there's a lot of misunderstanding about Celebrate Recovery and what it does and who it's for and all. A lot of misunderstanding. And so uh, I'm going to be interv- inter- introducing their leadership, and we're going to be having some conversation. Now, all of our, all of our small groups sort of deal in these healing choices we've been talking about. They, we all sort of, all of our small groups engage in, in one or, 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 you know, a number of those healing choices. But Celebrate Recovery engages in each and every one of them very intentionally. So I value CR so much because it's a forward-looking growth, growth process. So, so many of today's sort of, you know, get healthy, get spiritually healthy, get emotionally healthy sort of recovery programs, they focus on the past. Now, there, there's value in processing some, some things from your past. I'm not, I'm not condemning that. But the reality is you're not your past. You are not your past. Your past influences you, but your past does not define you. See, what matters today is not your past. What matters today is the direction your feet are heading, the direction your heart is facing today. So I don't care what you've done or how long you did it or with who you did it with. I, that's, that's, your, that's not you. Satan will tell you it's you, but it's not the truth. You are the direction your feet are headed right now. Why do I say that? It's exactly what Paul talks about in Philippians. He's talking about what inspires him as a believer and what he aspires to as a Jesus follower. And he says this, it's familiar to many of you. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. I'm like, thank you, Paul, for being honest with us because it appears you always have your act together. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Notice, no dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. I'm so grateful for his transparency here. But I focus on this one thing. Where's his focus? Forgetting the past. Do you see that? Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on, there's the continue uh, uh, mode I'm talking about. I continue to press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. You see, don't focus on what happened, focus on what you want to happen. That's where our focus needs to be. Please realize, Spiritual growth, friends, is not an unbroken string of successes. <laughs> it's not just a simple, unbroken string of successes. Nobody goes through life with this unbroken string of successes. No struggle, no suffering, no sin. It just doesn't happen. That's just not real. Growth is a curvy road, isn't it? <laughs> I wish it wasn't, but it, it, in my life, sometimes it feels like Switchbacks, right? The road to maturity is jagged. The road to recovery has a lot of twists and turns. The road to health and wholeness and spiritual maturity often means three steps forward, two steps back. Three steps forward, two steps back, often. So don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up. So how do we... How do we keep from getting discouraged when we 
make those mistakes, when we fall, when we fail, when we relapse, whatever you want to call it, making the same mistake again. How do we keep from getting discouraged? Let me, let me offer this next one, number four. You face and forsake your failures quickly. Face and forsake your failures quickly. Proverbs 28, 13 says, people who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Okay? Guys, we're going to stumble in life. We're going to stumble. Remember, we say around Foothills Church, I think Phil actually coined this phrase, direction, not perfection. Direction, not perfection. It's about the direction, not perfection. The key is not you know, getting all spun up about living a perfect life. The key is facing and forsaking your failures quickly. Don't, don't try to cover them up. Don't try to blame others. Don't try to excuse yourself. Face it. Own it quickly. Own it quickly. Don't let, don't let this stuff pile up, your failures pile up in your life. Keep short accounts with God. Take out the garbage regularly, okay? Take out the trash regularly. Don't let it pile up. And when you stumble, don't think, ah, I shouldn't be stumbling. I've been following Jesus 20 years, 30 years, 40. I shouldn't have that temptation. I shouldn't stumble like that. Don't beat yourself up. Don't try to cover it up. Confess it, forsake it quickly. Move on. <laughs> Don't beat yourself up. Remind this, some, this string. If this ball of string re represents your life, there's going to be days where you drop it, right? When you do that, don't beat yourself up. Pick that up. Did the whole ball of yarn un unravel? Did your whole life unravel? No. Nobody's pick it up. And, we, and we, we, we wrap it up again, and we start afresh. See, that's, that's the image of what happens when we fail. You're going to drop this ball of yarn in your life. You're going to drop it. You're going to fumble it. It's going to fall. The whole thing doesn't unravel. You pick it back up. You pick it back up. You wrap it up again, and you move forward. You with me? Now, what, what can you do to keep yourself from fumbling it as often? Because that's the other thing. We keep going. We try to go move forward. We wrap it up. We try to move forward. We say, I want to do, do everything I can to keep that from happening again. Well, what, what can we do to keep that from happening again? This is number five. I, f I have to flee temptation. I have to flee temptation, but don't fear it. I have to flee temptation, but don't fear it. So many people, when they're tempted, they get all intimidated by it. it it's, like it sh it's like they think, I shouldn't be tempted. <laughs> why, why do you think you should be tempted? Don't feel guilty about temptation. It's not sin to be tempted. It's sin to give in to temptation. I mean, the Bible tells us Jesus was tempted in all ways, yet was without sin. That means Jesus experienced every temptation known to man, every one of them, but he didn't give in to it. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's what you do with it. Martin Luther said this, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Okay? When, when temptations come to your mind, don't get intimidated from them. Some people feel a ton of shame. I've been a Christian 20 years. Why should I have this temptation? Hey, let me let you in on a little secret. The closer you get to God, the harder the enemy is going to work on you. The closer you get to God, the harder Satan is going to fight against you. If you're not that close with God, he's not even going to worry about you because you're screwing up your life on your own. But you get close to God, Satan's going to throw out all the attacks he can. So there's two things that you need to stay away from. Tempting situations and tempting associations. 
tempting situations and tempting associations. Tempting situations, in other words, stay away from the circumstances that, that, that lure you in or are, or are difficult for you. And, and tempting associations, stay away from people that tempt you. Sometimes I'll say, you got to change your places and you got to change your people if you want to get better. I mean, if you don't want to get stung, it's probably a good idea not to hang around beehives. Right? I mean, you hang around a barbershop long enough, you're, you're going to end up with a haircut. <laughs> right? You, you, go, you hang around the coffee shop you're probably going to smell the smells and feel the vibe and you're going to end up with a cup of coffee. I mean, if you have a problem with alcohol, not, not a good idea to go to a bar to have lunch and eat a sandwich. You see what I'm saying? So you need to know what tempts you, when it tempts you, where it tempts you, who tempts you, and just stay away from those situations and those associations. This is very practical advice for you. Let me give you some examples of how the scripture talks about this. The Bible's clear when it says, flee from sexual immorality. <laughs> this is just one example. Not saunter, not mosey, not, you know, crawl. Run! You got to. And in 1 Timothy 6, Paul says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. If that's your issue, see, you got to be, you got to be careful. 1 Corinthians 15, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Situations and associations, friends. Number six, if you're going to make it to the finish line, if you're going to grow continuously, you're going to want to be a part of a supportive community. You're going to want to be a part of some type of supportive community, small group. Guys, the Christian life is not meant to be lived in a relational vacuum. It just isn't. The Bible knows nothing about a Christian disconnected from community. See? Paul regularly comments on the value of the support and the prayers that he got from other people. He regularly comments about how uh, grateful he is for those who are supporting him. They pray for his ministry. They support his ministry. They pray for his personal spiritual life, pray for his protection from the enemy. So you and I, we need nothing less than that. We, we need people in our corner. We need people praying for us and supporting us and encouraging us to fight against spiritual attack and to do what we need to do to, you know, to, to course correct from spiritual erosion. Hebrews 10, very familiar verse to many of you. Let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some in their habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. See, very practical. I mean, some of you might be sitting there going, well, I, I, tried, I tried a small group once. I, I, I didn't work out. So I, I just never, I never went back. I never tried. I never went back. See, if, you, if, that's, if, if that's you, I would encourage you, don't give up on small groups. Don't give up. Just because you had one bad experience. I mean, if you, ever, if you ever go to a doctor and you don't like that doctor, you just go, oh, I'm just never going to go to the doctor again. Nah. You ever have a sleepless night? You ever have trouble, any of you trouble sleeping, some of you? I'm just, I'm just not going to sleep anymore. Right? So if you've, if you've had a bad experience 
in some sort of growth group or small group or accountability group, or whatever. If you had a bad experience, try again. Try again. You have to. If you're going to thrive, if you're going to live your best life as a believer, if you're going to finish well, we got to do this together. We have to do this together. Now, as you practice these six directives, there's one last thing that you can do. The seventh one today. See, that wasn't too painful, was it? Went fast. See, if you slept, you woke up, it's like it was so fast. <laughs> last one, follow Christ to the finish line, friends. Follow Christ to the finish line. One of the greatest sort of promises from the Bible is Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this, I started week one in our series with this. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the great day of Christ Jesus. Isn't that good news? Such an encouragement. In all of these healing choices that we've been talking about in this series, to know that God starts what he, fin what he starts, he finishes. That what he starts, he finishes. That's our encouragement. That's our hope. I mean, at different times in this series, you may have walked away pretty discouraged. Maybe, maybe you're discouraged today. But let me encourage you with Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. It may be that God brought you here or prompted you to tune in online just to whisper that promise to you. Don't give up. You dropped a ball of yarn in your life and unraveled a little bit, pick it up, roll it up. Take the next steps, move forward, focus on the forward. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Keep on keeping on, friends. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these encouraging pieces of your scripture which remind us that you're in this with us and you're our, our power and our energy to move forward and to grow and to, to, to continue to be healthy. It's your power in us that fights off the enemy who is relentless with his attacks. And Lord, we know that our journeys with you aren't going to be this straight upward to the right trajectory. We, we know we're going to have our moments and it's in those times where we are most thankful for your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, and your love, that environment of healing that you have created around us and in us through your presence. So keep empowering us, Lord Jesus. We need you 100%. We need you 100%. In your name, amen.